I'm Cliff Lynch, and let me welcome you to this session, which I'm going to be uh, conducting, which is really about sort of taking another look at institutional repositories. Uh, as I say, I hope that some of this session can really be pretty conversational, but um, let me give you kind of a little background on what brought me to this, and then uh, a, a quick outline of some of the topics I want to cover in the hour or so that we have. Um, institutional repositories are an idea that's been around since um, shortly after the turn of the century. Um, isn't that a wonderful phrase? Uh, uh, make, makes you really feel old. Um, anyway, uh, it's something that CNI has been following um, pretty intensively over the years as part of our broader focus on changes in scholarly communication, on digital preservation, and the management of um, scientific and scholarly assets in the digital environment. And we we tracked some of the early deployment working with a number of partners um, of institutional repositories. We've certainly been part of the ongoing conversation, although things like longitudinal data gathering about repository deployment uh, has been passed on to other organizations following on some of our initial work. At the same time, there's a lot of uh, weird discussion going on about repositories now. Um, there are, it, it's clear that there are some really fundamentally, um, if not incompatible, then at least divergent ideas about repositories that are emerging that are making the conversation very confusing. Um, it, it's, it's at the point now where you kind of need to know who you're talking to about institutional repositories to understand exactly what conversation you're having because people really do mean quite different things. There are some interesting discussions, especially in the press, about you know, raising the sort of questions that um, people love to raise in journalistic environments. Have institutional repositories failed? Um, this is a very interesting piece of rhetoric uh, uh, because, of course, it invites you to engage the question of what does it mean to succeed or fail? And I'll come back to that one in, in, in some detail. Um, finally, there is, I think, a perception that for better or worse, succeeded or failed, that institutional repositories have reached a certain level of maturity at this point, and that we need to recognize that they're here to stay, and we need to think about how they interconnect up with a lot of other components in the broad infrastructure of um, systems and struct and uh, um, other apparatus that support scholarly communication, libraries, the intellectual record, a whole lot of things. Um, there's a piece of rhetoric that I find troublesome about how we take repositories to the next stage by thinking of an infrastructure of repositories. I prefer to, and, and, and would argue it's more fruitful to think about how repositories participate in the infrastructure and connect up to other infrastructure components. And so that's another place that I want to look. So here are some of the things that I'd like to kind of work through in the next uh, hour. And um, this is all part of, you know, as I said, CNI's kind of continuing look at institutional repositories in a in the sort of broader context, uh, we'll probably be producing um, a couple of articles or white papers or something in those line, along those lines later in the program year dealing with some of this, but I thought it would be very helpful at this point to have kind of a community um, conversation. So um, that, that's, the, that's the immediate context here. So 
the specifics that we want to, that I hope we can get through are what does an institutional repository mean? Some discussion of this question about success, failure, um, expectations more broadly. Um, a little bit about strategies for populating repositories and how the landscape has changed there. Some conversation about repositories in the broader infrastructure and in particular in that context I'll say a little bit about a meeting I was at last month in Europe that was um, jointly sponsored by JISC in the UK and the SURF Foundation and that tried to bring together a lot of people interested in institutional repositories to look at some of the sort of next steps in their evolution. And then finally, if we have time, a few comments about repositories in, in the broader context of service delivery, especially around de-research. So let me, let me start at the beginning here with this question of, of definitions. One of the definitions is really about repositories being a very general purpose place to store digital materials that come out of a scholarly community, um, uh, like a university. That might include data sets, it might include collections of images, it might include um, software code, uh, interactive models of various kinds, manuscripts, papers, books, learning objects, very broad. Um, and obviously, for most institutions, simply hanging out a shingle like that and saying, send us whatever, um, is not really you know, the optimal um, strategy for introducing it to the campus community. Um, you do need to, uh, at least the experience of many institutions has been focusing on some specific area of the community or some specific genre of materials or some combination of the two is uh, a, a clearer strategy than simply saying, you know, we'll take anything that's in need of a home. Um, there is another view of repositories, and I would say this is a view that's particularly strong in Europe, um, which says that repositories are basically where you put the published output of the faculty, and particularly their journal articles. And there are a set of games that you play having to do with copyright transfer and, and how you're dealing with publisher relations about whether it's a preprint or whether it's uh, a copy of the actual published article if the, um, if the publisher will let you have that. But basically the, the, the fundamental idea is to represent published faculty journal output. Um, these are very interesting. Um, these kinds of repositories because, at least to my mind, they have a radically different character than these sort of general repositories. They fit in a very different policy um, They lead to discussions about things like open access, open access mandates, um, uh, various kinds of agendas about opening the scientific literature. Um, so, so they really take us off to a very different part of the universe than this kind of broader issue of, of digital materials. Now, it's quite striking to me that when you look at these ePrint repositories that what you're dealing with here doesn't feel very digital to me. It's actually mostly electronic paper because that's exactly you know, what's coming out in these journals still as they've migrated to digital delivery. The articles still look a whole lot like electronic representations of paper. And arguably, at least, from a stewardship perspective, 
This is the least endangered kind of material because we understand it very well. It has publishing venues. It has um, systems that are set up that are connected to the traditional scholarly publishing system to archive this material. Think things like locks or portico. Um, uh, it's really very familiar stuff. So the, the issues with ePrint repositories are really not much around stewardship, they're really about around access, at least the way I read it. Quite a striking discrepancy. Now, I, 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 will, I will tell you, I've had some very interesting conversations recently um, with some of the folks who are very committed to ePrint repositories, who are now starting to talk about, well, the, the, the sort of, um, maturity, um, the maturing uh, arc for these is that we'll begin to consider articles with supplementary digital materials. So we'll begin to introduce the, you know, the truly born digital content, the kinds of things that do need life cycle stewardship um, uh, and that, that aren't being well accommodated in the publishing um, models that we're familiar with, we'll treat that as ancillary material, as supplements or enriched articles, but the foundation of our repositories, the sort of point of departure, will still be collections of articles. I find that very, very interesting. Um, and uh, I, I personally don't think it's liable to be a very fruitful way to engage e-science going forward. Um, but I, I, it, it's an interesting approach to try and open up a little bit the e-print view of, of the future of repositories. I'd note that there's sort of one other um, uh, niche area um, which has motivated a number of repository programs, and that's electronic theses and dissertation programs. Um, to the extent that your electronic theses and dissertations are PDF files, for example, it's not a big intellectual or technical leap to accommodate those in a system that's designed to deal with PDFs of articles. Um, but it's quite, reasonable to see people uh, um, identifying an electronic thesis and dissertation program as one of the initial motivators for um, creating some kind of institutional repository service, um, quite separate from questions about capturing faculty publication. Um, it, it actually comes again from a very different kind of policy and intellectual frame. Now, I'm a little nervous that it seems to have become an article of, of faith, at least as I travel around and talk to institutions, that virtually every institution should have an institutional repository. Um, and um, that this should be done without much consideration of what you want to capture, or the amount of material you want to capture. I'd suggest, for example, if the main reason you have this is to do theses and dissertations, um, you might want to count up how many theses and dissertations your institution actually produces per year and think about whether a locally hosted thing really is the most cost-effective way to handle that. I think that, um, there's a lot of confusion around this kind of question. Um, uh, what, what I guess I worry about is that institutional repositories and the creation of such a service has become kind of a, a way of a, an institution signaling that it's serious about engaging um, changes in scholarly communication rather than a sort of a well thought out piece of a strategy for that. Um, uh, occasionally, I go to places and I will 
talk to colleagues who will tell me proudly, we've just gotten approval to do an institutional repository. And I'll ask, what are you going to put in it? What program is it going to support? And I get very nervous when there's not a clear answer for that. But I think we actually are at that stage sometimes. Now, let me flip to this question of have institutional repositories succeeded or failed? Um, I would suggest that if what you're trying to do is run an ePrint repository, um, that's blessedly a pretty easy question to answer. Um, if your stated purpose is to capture a record of published faculty output, your major issues are, one, getting faculty to um, put their material in the repository and their various approaches to that, outreach, mandates, um, uh, research assessment exercises in countries other than the uh, United States, which um, really provide very strong motivation for universities to um, get a very structured kind of documentation of their faculty output. You can actually make quite credible estimates of the number of articles published by faculty at a given institution in a given year. And you can actually do quite credible statistical things looking at a repository of ePrints which permit you to make statements like, we think we've got about 70% coverage this year. Last year, we think we had about 65% coverage. We're doing well and, do, and do, steadily improving. This is a great success. Or to allow you less happily to do things like um, uh, the National Library of Medicine did before mandates and said, uh, oh, we have about 2% coverage. This is not so wonderful. Um, that's great if that's what you're trying to accomplish. I'd suggest also that you know if you have an ETD program and um, if what you've done is mandated that everybody put their thesis in there in order to graduate and you know how many people you're graduating, you have a pretty good uh, measure of success there and um, can, can test and enforce compliance pretty effectively. But let's take that broader picture for a minute, that issue of repositories as a, a, a tool for providing stewardship for material throughout its life cycle in the digital world. How would we test success there? Does the fact that a given repository doesn't have a million things in it yet mean that it's failed? Does something with only a relatively small number of contributions per year signal failure? I don't think we really know the answer to this. Um, indeed, the answers to this are somewhat intractable, but I think we need to be honest and fairly aggressive about, um, uh, about leaving open the questions about success or failure. At one level, I think you could argue that success is would be recognized by the fact that over a substantial period of time, scholarship and evidence to support scholarship survives for re-examination, reinterpretation, and reuse in settings which it would not have done in the absence of an institutional repository. That would be a success measure. Now, let, let's just consider how horrible that is to apply in practice. In the first place, it involves long, unspecified periods of time. In the second place, it involves a, a negative material that would not otherwise have survived. Always an easy thing to prove. Um, that's important material that turns out to be valuable for scholarly reuse and reinterpretation and reexamination across time. Um, something we're notoriously poor at predicting even in the physical world over long periods of time. 
Yet I think if we're really honest about the way we frame institutional repositories, something like that would have to approximate the success measure. And it's a, it's a very uncomfortable success measure, but it's exactly, you know, at some level, the same success measure that we apply to stewardship around cultural and scholarly uh, materials going forward, independent of format. Um, it's exactly the kind of uncomfortable success measure around stewardship that we've always struggled with. I'll say one more thing, too. Um, if you look again at the very comfortable kind of ePrint interpretation of a repository, not only can you measure success at some level um, in terms of the amount of faculty publication it represents, you can actually, you know what the time horizon is. Most faculty publish fairly often, so taking let's say annual snapshots or something like that, is a very reasonable thing to do. I, I've actually even seen some arguments coming out of some of our colleagues in the UK that say that if you look kind of annualized across the academic year pattern of deposit as opposed to you know one big spike once a year when somebody comes round and says we're going to audit our deposit mandate in two weeks is really the sign of a truly healthy repository that people are, are feeding it as part of the normal reg routine publication workflow as distinct from um, this sort of separate nuisance that you deal with once a year when you're reminded of it. Now, in this kind of broader context, if we want to try, try and track deposits and contributions as progress, this takes us into a um, set of questions about what's the life cycle of different scholarly material? How, how, when, when is a faculty member who's produced it or captured it um, prepared to relinquish control? Um, when does it make sense for he or she to move a copy of it to the institutional repository for longer term stewardship? I'm thinking that the answer to that certainly is not one of months. It's at the very least one of years. It's a cycle that perhaps is tied up with the, the completion of grants that run multiple years, or even series of grants, the um, shifting of a scholar's interest from one topic to another, and a sense that they've, you know, they've finished that book or exhausted that data set or line of inquiry, and they're ready to move on to something a bit different. Um, perhaps it even literally is uh, tied to the career life cycle of scholars, that um, these kind of deposits are something that you think deeply about as you start thinking about, um, uh, you know, concluding um, much of your career's work. And you recognize that you've amassed a set of material that um, is going to be far beyond your capabilities to do justice to. You've, um, uh, you've worked with other colleagues on some of it, and you want to make sure that it moves on and, and survives in an orderly way. I don't think we know these questions about life cycle in the digital world um, well at all. We, there, there have been a few investigations in very specific areas. I think that they lend themselves to a degree to be studied empirically, although they have one of these um, bad characteristics that some of them are fairly long-term. Um, what, what one would really like to do is, is studies of considerable time duration in this area, and those are always harder to do than you know, year-long kind of snapshots, um, just in terms of, of mobilizing researcher um, interest. But I think that when we really talk of success and failure, these may be the kinds of criteria we need to think about. Um, I've at least not been able to come up with um, uh, 
ones that are substantially more quantitative uh, outside of the sort of um, straightforward ePrint model. One can imagine in, a, in perhaps another decade as practices around e-science and e-research mature, being able to get some insight into it through mechanisms like this. Um, it, it's, it's, it, it's becoming more and more clear that funding agencies are calling for um, data sharing and data management plans as part of grant proposals. Now, basically, what these begin to do is identify and inventory content assets that come out of grant-supported work. To the extent that these are accurate in predictive inventories, one might be able to gain some insight by going back and looking at what happened to this material. Now, simply saying, is it all in the institutional repository, obviously isn't going to give you the right answer because in some cases these kind of funded data sets will end up in disciplinary repositories in various um, uh, settings um, rather than institutional ones. But you can ask questions about are at least some of these represented in the institutional repositories and did the institutional repositories play a role in their survival. I'd, I, I'd, I'd um, qualify this by saying that while this may be a route to some insight, um, the institutional repositories are perhaps most desperately needed by those scholars that don't get a lot of grants, that aren't in disciplines with good infrastructure for disciplinary management of content assets, that really have no one to rely on except their institution in terms of the preservation of their scholarship and their evidence. And those are the folks who won't have data management and data sharing plans on file with your Office of Contracts, Grants, and Sponsored Research. So those are a few reflections about success and failure in this environment, which I think are worth at least thinking hard about. Um, I personally am very uneasy with this, these sort of binary notions of, of success and failure in this setting and more comfortable with questions about, uh, asking questions about the, the contribution that these services have made across time and then in evaluating resource commitments to these services by weighing those contributions versus the contributions that could be made by uh, redirecting resources into other kinds of activities. So those are a couple of reflections on kind of the current state of the discussion around institutional repositories. Um, I think what I'd like to do is pause for some reactions and, and pushback or, or other um, views on that before I go on to talk about um, repositories in the broader infrastructure a bit. Um, I know that you know many of you have probably been following these same debates that I've kind of uh, summarized and perhaps a little bit caricatured here. Um, I'm sure at least some of you have had people come to you and say, um, did you know that repositories are a failure? Um, or um, how do you know your repository is a success? Uh, I'd be very interested in takes from you all on some of those comments. Uh, we'll, we'll, I'll get you next floor. Yes. Deborah Ludwig, University of Kansas. Cliff, I was thinking about the, the quanti qual quantitative um, measures and wondering if anybody is looking at qualitative measures related to faculty publications in um, institutional repositories. And I ask it because we're very close at KU to a, 
a faculty senate vote on an open access policy for the entire faculty. And one of the criticisms that has come out is, well, the institutional repository represents something of lesser quality. And frankly, I, as faculty X, don't want to include my materials with the rest of that dross. So let me throw that back to you. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I've heard the same kind of question, um, and uh, I think it's a very important question. Um, I, I personally, I think that you know one of, one of the very scary things we've done is interconnected um, institutional repositories with some of these questions about open access mandates, um, because I think it's a tremendous source of confusion, especially for the faculty. Um, I, I mean, personally, I would be happy with an open access mandate that said, um, you know, put it anywhere public, put it in the physics archive, put it in, um, put it in uh, the PubMed Central archive. You don't have to put it in your institutional archive um, uh, or and actually, it would be very easy later on to let these systems feed each other. Um, when, when we come to you know, our discussion about infrastructure sorts of things, um, it, it's really clear that we want a certain amount of replication in here that happens fairly automatically. But I think that the, the, the core difficulty there is that um, we're, we're starting to give signals to our faculty that conflate putting things in the repository with publication. And that leads them then to think about, well, how do we, um, you know, what, what, what's, the, what's the level of quality and prestige of our repository as opposed to other publishing outlets I might select? Um, uh, and, you know, the notion of taking a repository and comparing it to a, a, a journal seems to me to be apples and oranges. Um, particularly to the extent that you, you start dealing with things that don't even look like journal articles. Um, uh, you know, we really don't have a good way to answer that question, but I think that I think that we need to be very careful about um, the, the suggestions that are sometimes made that um, repositories can represent a, a form of publication that captures the evaluative characteristics of um, traditional journal publication, for example. Um, the, the other thing I'd say, and I've run into a few places who in response to this, you know, start thinking about, well, maybe we should run peer review for the repository in some fashion. Um, that seems to me to be very problematic for two reasons. One is that the kind of um, credibility you're gonna get from an institutionally based peer review is limited. Um, the second is that it, it seems to me to run counter to the whole purpose of institutional repositories. I mean, the, my, my you know, personal preference on this is subject things to some kind of um, limited sanity check, for example. Um, you know, if someone wants to give you 30 petabytes of, um, you know, uh, CNN news that they've captured off of TV in high definition. You may need to talk with them about things ranging from the cost of storage to copyright law. Um, uh, but fundamentally, you know, I think your argument should be your institution is selective in its hiring of faculty in the first place. You hire them and you give them um, frameworks for operating like notions of academic freedom as, um, uh, you know, as a, as a consequence of this and probably affiliation as a faculty member is probably a perfectly reasonable sort of first cut at admitting things to repositories. Probably for students you want some kind of 
arrangement where they're either sponsored by a faculty member or, or, or doing something that's um, you know, structurally reviewed like a thesis or dissertation. Um, but I, I, think we, I, I think we've really run the risk of, of talking ourselves into a real bind there. Um, uh, um, people are trying to apply standards that I think aren't really relevant. Paula? Paula Hoffman, Illinois. I was going to raise the same kind of quality and selectivity issues, but from a slightly different perspective. Our institutional repositories, for the most part, have a library brand on them. And, and as you've just pointed out, we've always been selective. Mm -hmm. My institution may be a, a little different in that we run a university archives that collects faculty papers. Mm -hmm. But carrying out your argument that all faculty at our institution must have some kind of quality, we in fact reject um, any number of uh, requests to deposit faculty papers in our archives using a set of criteria. Mm -hmm. So really the same kind of question about how do we determine quality <coughs> or how do we determine what we select and what we don't select. Mm -hmm. And Ed, it's a harder question for us to ask, I think, at this point because um, many <coughs> institutional repositories are looking for things. Yeah. But if we project out, you know, however many years from now, you know, do we want it to be filled with everything or anything except the obvious you know, mm -hmm. tapings? Um, or do we want to start with some set of criteria? I, I think that's a really, really interesting question. And putting it in the context of things like faculty papers going into university archives, which I know many universities have various kinds of qualifications on that. They, they accept selectively, um, both in terms of what they'll take from a given faculty member and which faculty members they'll, they'll accept from in many cases. Um, that, I think that's a very interesting kind of, um, uh, you know, um, uh, test point to put out here and is exactly the kind of thing we probably need to be considering if we're going to have a nuanced discussion about success, failure, impact, etc. cetera. Um, I'd suggest maybe that one of the, th there are a couple of things that are a little different about archives. One is that usually once you take something, you're kind of taking it forever. Um, uh, you know, the notion that you take a faculty member's papers and then decide 30 or 40 years later that, eh, nobody's really interested in them, we'll just put them out in the dumpster in the back. Um, you try not to get into that situation. Um, with some of this digital material, I think it has a natural life cycle, um, which isn't necessarily forever. And we need to be able to talk about managing through life cycles, particularly when we look at some of the material that comes out of, um, of research, data sets and observational data and things like that. Um, I, I think we're starting to grapple with the notion that um, these things don't simply um, either get tossed immediately or kept forever, that there's a whole range of kind of intermediate possibilities. And um, uh, those are, I think, in play in the repository setting. I think another piece of this is that some real consideration of the, the, the basis on which an archive would make those choices, would provide very helpful guidance for repositories in thinking about things. But when you think about this, just, just recognize how different the level of interaction is here. And I, I, I think this gets at some of the, the extreme bifurcation between these ePrint things and the sort of broader idea of a repository. In the case of an ePrint, you have a lot of faculty who are probably publishing three, four, six, ten papers a year. So they're interacting on a very transactional basis with this and um, it's a kind of a transactional basis that makes, and frequency that makes human review very expensive and in fact 
impractical in many cases other than to do some you know, simple checking. Did I get the file in a readable way? Does it have some minimal metadata on it? The discussion with an archive happens once in a faculty member's career, typically. This is a discussion that actually can involve some, you know, um, uh, more elaborated human appraisal. Somebody might actually consider, well, what did that faculty member do? What's in all those boxes? Who might be interested? Um, so, uh, you know, the notion of having a repository deposit that's at that scale and frequency level is something that I think has been rather alien to our thinking so far um, and is much more akin to the sort of um, thinking that drives the acquisition of whole sub-collections into an archive or special collections environment. Um, uh, but is one that I'd argue at least perhaps we really need to move into our, our, our thinking about institutional repositories. Um, that, that's a, that, I think that's a wonderful you know, kind of um, test case to hold up for perspective. Maybe take one or two more comments on this. David. So I want to look forward in a rather different direction, which is that, so you're talking about the distinction between PDF type mm -hmm. deposit and deposit of things like data sets, but increasingly people are wrapping uh, data sets and so on in workflows and services and so on as opposed to, and that needs a very different kind of, of repository infrastructure mm -hmm. than, than even just to say, okay, here's a data set, here are the bits, keep mm -hmm. the bits. Uh, are, are, are people looking forward in that direction, or is this something we're going to end up with? Somebody walks up to the to the repository with this popular service that a lot of people depend on, and say, "Well, you know, I'm I'm retiring or I'm moving to another institution. Here it is. Take care of it." Um, I I think that that's intellectually certainly in scope. I think pragmatically. Um, institutions are having so much trouble just dealing with, if you'll sort of allow me a very loose term, document-ish or data set-ish things as opposed to services, um, that the kinds of things you're describing where we truly don't know how to handle them technically in a lot of ways um, uh, are really, you know, people will admit intellectually, yes, we're going to have to deal with them, but they, they have no idea what to do. I, I would suspect that, you know, we're going to see a, a set of kind of boundary cases that um, are a little bit more manageable that people will be poking at. Those will include, in my view, things like simulations of various kinds, um, games, computer games of various sorts, although um, I think that particularly when you get into multiplayer games, we are rapidly again into, we know this is a problem and we have no idea what to do about it pragmatically, um, territory. I think the other, the other area you'll see some progress is software. Uh, I think people are starting to recognize software as a kind of a, legitimate form of, of expression that's, that's worthy of preservation in a range of different tactics and, and levels. Um, you know, at one level, the, um, the large source um, management sys archive systems like uh, you discussed yesterday at other levels, just executables that can run within a um, um, some kind of specified emulation-y environment. Um, but I, I, I think that, uh, you know, when you get out on the, the frontiers there, um, we have got some, you know, enormous foundational questions about how to approach preservation of that um, that are unanswered as well as the, the kind of more tactical things about how to do it. Um, so, um, 
I, I think it's going to be a while before you see many services that effectively set up for that. Um, one of the things I worry a lot about is that it is a kind of an intermediate stage there where you've got large-scale systems that have been built up by a faculty member or a team that's anchored by a faculty member and that when that faculty member moves on or retires, the, the pathways to institutionalize those um, are, are very, very shaky. I mean, I look at something like um, oh, the work Greg Crane is doing on Perseus, for example, and um, you know, I really wonder, um, uh, you know, how how many more, how many years will that go on if Greg lost um, interest in it for some reason um, and didn't, you know, continually uh, drive the funding of the platform and the you know rejuvenation of a team around it. Yet, imagine depositing, what, what would it mean to deposit <laughs> Perseus in an institutional repository? Um, you know, yeah. Well, having been a tough one, they tried to do that. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. And it didn't work. Mm -hmm. um, no, I, I wanted to echo this sense of, of the polymorphous desire of this, this thing we're calling a repository. Uh, and at, at Princeton, I think it's, it really has become very much like the proverbial elephant that's being mm -hmm. in different, different ways. And so I'm particularly interested in the way you've been seeing people teasing this out between the sort of universal uh, touring tape storage device that's short-term preservation and puts everything, for preservation is just a backup, and these large institutional issues. Because everyone has this, this need to park their data somewhere. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the, I think the criteria for failure is exactly that, that point at which it's not going to meet these particular notions of what a repository is. And as various players in the institutional uh, domain begin to recognize that it's not gelling around their particular idea, they're going mm -hmm. to say fail. Well, I, I, I think actually that's, a, that's not only a good question, it makes a nice connection to the last bit of stuff that I was, I was going to talk about, of course, there's a large middle bit of stuff about repositories as infrastructure we've missed. But um, let, me, let me try and link up to some of that. Um, I think that there is a view that repositories are coupled on some level with an institutional commitment to stewardship. Now, that's not the same as a commitment to preserve forever. I think uh, I more and more hear very explicit recognitions about um, life cycles uh, that are attached to various genres of material and trying to develop ways to think about life cycles. Um, uh, we did an executive roundtable yesterday, for example, talking about lecture capture. And that's, that's a perfect example of material that is starting to get produced at some scale by many of our institutions. So you can ask some really direct questions about, well, now what's your asset management strategy on this? And where are you going to carry out that asset management strategy? Well, you could certainly put it in a repository. Um, but you need to think about, if it's just for a given class, for the duration of a given class, for the consultation and review of students in that class, it probably doesn't belong in a repository. It probably belongs in the learning management system or in some other special purpose thing. If you're going to keep it for a few years, but not necessarily archivally, it might go in the repository with a notion that um, you know, you're going to refresh this or junk it every few years. Um, and, you know, if it turns out that before you junk it, the, um, the lecturer wins the Nobel Prize, you'll move it over to the stack of stuff you, you know, keep longer term. Not necessarily because a lot of people are going to want to watch it, but just because it seems like you ought to keep it. Um, so th those are, you know, examples. Other examples are very much um, going to be driven, I think, by 
um, data retention requirements on grants where you make, you'll make a commitment to 10 years, say, and um, after 10 years, people will have to decide, is it really worth tying up the storage space? Is someone really likely to come back to it? So I, I, I think that that idea of life cycle is, is, is very key, and one of the challenging things we face at our institutions as we try and think about digital assets is processes to define those life cycles. Now, on the other side, there's this question of how close are repositories to usage environments for data? In other words, you occasionally will run into this picture that says that you know, a repository is really just sort of like network storage. And you know, every time you hit save on your word processor, another version goes into your repository. Um, and all of your sort of working temporary versions of, of everything you do. I don't think people mostly want that. Um, I, I think that's probably a bad idea. You want some, some slightly higher bar for placing a version in a repository than hitting the save button. Um, how you get at that um, is, is, is not entirely clear to me. Um, uh, I, I think what you don't want, for example, is phenomena where while someone's working on something, they have 90 versions of something in a repository, and then when they final it, they collapse those down to you know, a final version, two intermediates, and throw the rest away. I don't think you want that much volatility in your repository fundamentally. But how we explain that and differentiate repositories clearly from network storage to potential users of the repository I think is a big challenge um, because it doesn't lend itself to really bright line things. The, the, the two last points I'd make here are there's a lot of discussion about what the repositories, ha how, how repositories link up with e-research for example and um, the use of repositories to manage data sets. I think that we need to be very mindful that the performance characteristics of a repository may be very different from the performance um, characteristics that you want for the storage of data sets that are an active part of an e-science stream. So, um, you know, if you're looking at, at doing computation, even read-only computation, on a large data set in an e-science setting, um, you may very well, I think, end up wanting to stage a copy of that to higher performance storage, storage with better connectivity to national high performance um, networks or grids to do that computation than to have the expectation that you can just beat on the thing in the repository. Um, some of the sort of lower end versions of that are very interesting too. Um, you hear people talk about, well, what should we do with video in a repository? Um, one extreme case of that is, well, you put it in as a file and you yeah, pull it out as a file and that's all the repository knows how to do with video. Um, drop it in as a file, pull it out as a, a file. And if you want to do anything clever with um, transcoding it and s for various streaming settings or something, you do that outside the repository on a video server that's provisioned for that in terms of software, connectivity, and, and cycles. So I, I think we have those kind of performance constraints too that need to be factored and explained into the repository setting. And some of those are, are liable um, as we go farther downstream to have some serious cost implications. Because the notion, for example, if you've got a big reference data set of moving it into a computational environment that's set up for that in order to really make use of it, and that redundancy has a real cost attached to it. Um, other comments? Okay. 
just wanted to go back to this question of um, publishing, the publishing idea. And um, we've actually taken that approach because the idea of the repository as a place to put stuff didn't seem to be very appealing, frankly. And so to conceive of it as a publishing alternative, a publishing platform with peer review capabilities that are not just in the institution, mm -hmm. they're done through the relationships that the faculty mm -hmm. have, um, has seemed to give us a, a different way to think about this. And um, I think it was also born out of the approach that we started with that our relationship wasn't with the individual faculty member, it was with the department, the research unit, and those, especially the research units, have relationships outside of the institution. Um, and just recently, we started, we have about 25 journals with another four or five to come. <clears throat> we started a new one where the editor is from Stanford, and she wrote a little um, uh, introduction explaining why she chose to use this tool because her relationships were with a research unit at one of the UC campuses. So I think this you know, sets a whole different framework in how to think about um, the value of the repository and how to evaluate its success. So I just wonder what your thoughts are on that. Um, I, I'm glad you raised that, actually. Um, I, I think that you know, what you've done setting up a publishing platform of that kind that can be used by departments, by intercampus OR research units and other things is wonderful. And I think, you know, the, the example you just gave of having a faculty member from outside come in and, uh, you know, place a journal on that platform is a measure of how well you've done in engineering that platform and getting it out there. I, I think that setting up those kinds of platforms in the context of um, universities uh, makes a ton of sense, and I think we're going to see a lot more of it. Um, I, 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 it's often affiliated with library operations, I think, rather than um, presses, traditional presses, because um, the libraries have more of a technology base, more access to grants and things. Although I know of a number of cases, I believe yours is one of them, where at least for some of the journals you have the press involved in, in, in various ways as well. The only thing I would say about this wonderful activity is I really wish you hadn't called it an institutional repository. <laughs> I wish you'd called it a publishing platform. Or, or a platform for, for um, you know, new scholarly communication. Um, because I see it, um, I, I see what you're doing as most essentially a publishing and dissemination activity as distinct from a stewardship activity. Um, that's, the, that, that's the contrast I'd draw, and I'd admit that's not a, you know, sort of a bright line where you can say it's all one or it's all the other. But um, I, I, my personal view is what you're doing is more, more about publishing. Um, uh, and, and I think the apparatus like peer review kind of emphasizes that character to it. Um, I think it's wonderful stuff, though. Howard. Um, I guess I feel like we, we we're, we're vacillating between two like very um, uh, distinct different approaches and uh, over the last decade and we, we, we're, we're, we're kind of, we're gonna end up in the middle but we're at one end and the other. I, I'm just thinking back to uh, 10 years ago when, um, when we were working on, um, uh, for instance, designing a preservation repository mm -hmm. for, um, University of California, and um, uh, we had huge fights uh, between people who believed that a preservation repository should be only for preservation, zero access, mm -hmm. and me, who lost, uh, who <laughs> believed that, that there had to be some access mm -hmm. permitted mm -hmm. to it, uh, mainly uh, as a, a, what, I, what I've always believed is, 
um, the best way you have of knowing that something goes bad is to have some degree of access. Yes. You know, so so that that, that that there is a necessity for some degree of access, and then uh, you know now we have things like the Happy Trust, um, who you know basically pr uh, are talking about providing full access to the repository, and they're not thinking of any kind of thing that's out there that's protected in in some ways. But it seems to me that we where we really should be is somewhere in between mm -hmm. where there's there is an, there's enough access to assure that the, that nothing is going bad or that you catch it while you can um, but that the real you know hammering on it access needs to have to happen somewhere else so I I, I think that's right I think that um, you know, what's always awkward about that is you're now into very relative terms about what constitutes hammering, and that, of course, changes as the price of cycles and the use practices on materials change. I, I think that, um, you know, one other aspect that we didn't get into at all here, but that what has been a very significant part of a lot of other um, discussions about the balance of access in preservation systems um, is, an, is one about intellectual property and so-called dark archives, um, where really um, licensing and, and intellectual property concerns shape a lot of what you can do as well. Um, I, I, I do think that, you know, as, as we deal with material here that is much more explicitly computational in its use, data sets, um, that, uh, you know, that relativism gets clearer because, um, uh, you know, last year's big data set is today's thumb drive um, uh, with all of the, you know, computational things that come along. Um, we are very, just about at the end of our time, um, which is awkward because I was going to tell you about repositories in infrastructure, and I was particularly going to mention things like identifiers and name authority and, um, some, and inter repository replication as areas that seem to be emerging um, uh, as calling for attention. Um, I guess the good news, though, is that we will have an opportunity to return to some of those things later. Um, there is going to be a report, I believe, in the next few weeks out of the uh, meeting that I mentioned briefly that took place in Amsterdam that gets into some of this. I'll make sure that um, a pointer to that gets out to uh, CNI announce when it's released. and. I imagine that we will have some opportunities, hopefully, in fact, before the uh, next CNI meeting um, in December to pursue some of those. I would just like to really thank you all for joining me this morning and helping to talk through some of these ideas. I would invite you and indeed urge you to think about some of these issues hard over the next few months um, because this whole question of stewardship strategies, repositories, and evaluation, um, I think is one that's coming up to be a very fundamental agenda item for many of our institutions. It's one we need good answers to. And I hope that this conversation if not providing answers, has at least helped to flesh out the agenda of questions that it might be worth you spending some time with your colleagues at your institution exploring. So thank you very much. <laughs>